Tom, what's up, man? Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you, brother. How are you, Ryan? Good to I'm be good. here. Good. Yeah, no, I've, I've been looking forward to this. I, I don't know if you know, I started jujitsu about three years ago or so. And I think that's when I came across you and I, I, we've been connected for probably a couple of years. So it's pretty cool to be able to finally have this conversation. Yeah, I remember. I, I, I remember I started following you and then I saw you train jujitsu. I didn't know you trained jujitsu at first, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, you were already you were already training. I remember I saw you at a blue belt time. So yeah, that's, that's cool. You know? It's been a good journey. I've really enjoyed it. I know it's been an integral part of your life, and I, I've obviously started later in my life when I was must have been thirty eight. You started training. How old were you when you started training jujitsu? I'm like nineteen. Okay. Nineteen. Oh so yeah. So I was a little, you know. I mean, some of these guys are starting at like five years old, you know. But uh, it's wild. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm happy I started when I did. I think if I would have started too young, it, it would have kind of, I don't know, it can wear you out. You know what I mean? Like, you see a lot of with the wrestling dads, you know, they, they drill, drill, drill their kids. They push, push, push. And by the time the kids are like 18, they hate wrestling, you know? Yeah, it's it's trying to find that balance. I've got, I know you have kids and I've got four. I would say if any of my kids are the most into it is my youngest. He's six. And Every day, it's like, Dad, let's go wrestle. Let's go wrestle. If there's a down minute or he sees me walking by, he's like, let's go wrestle. We have mats in my front room, so we'll go out there. And he says wrestling. You know, we're really training jujitsu, But at yeah. that age, it's all the same. It's not like we're going through technique and all that or no, drills. No, exactly. That's the thing. I think for, for me, it's like as long as they're exposed to it and used to it and they see what's going on. Like, you know, my son doesn't train yet, and he's six. My daughter doesn't either. Uh, mm. And she's 10 she will be forced to do it soon uh she'll have no choice but to do it once or twice a week just because self-defense is imperative uh she's a tough kid though but my son he'll take to it i believe but he's just a little wild right now to be on those mats but he comes with me to the school all the time he likes to like mess around and everything but he uh you know i think he'll be the one to really take to it as well more so than her for sure yeah. Yeah. It seems like there's always, I don't know if it's a certain personality, but I've realized and recognized that like you can actually learn a ton about somebody, even just in the first few seconds of training with somebody. Oh yeah, man. hundred percent for sure. You know, that's why a lot of people quit because they're forced to look at who they are and they don't end up, you know, who they tell themselves that they are is not who they really are. And when they're forced to look at themselves in the mirror, and you see nothing but truth looking back to you for some people. They don't want to admit that. Yeah. Too much. It's a pretty good litmus test, isn't it? Somebody comes and then they, you know, leave and you're like, got it. I understand. And look, it's not for everybody. I'm not saying everybody has to train jujitsu, but when somebody comes and they're like, yeah, I liked it and I want to be better, but they never come back. Like to me, that's a pretty good litmus test of whether or not they're serious. Bro, I had a guy come in. This is just a perfect example. He was uh, a power lifter, not a big guy, but he told me he was a power lifter. He's like 200, 190 pounds, whatever. You know, he was fit. He's taking the basic class. You can't train live in my academy until you have two stripes on your belt. Okay. If you can't stay, if you can't respect the rules enough to wait until your second stripe, I don't want you anyway. You mm. know? So this guy, man, he's like, oh, it's a little bit too boring for me. The basic class is like, you don't understand. I was like, you don't know anything. So if I put you to train live now, you're just going to use pure strength and aggression. You're going to end up getting hurt. But somebody else is going to get hurt. Somebody else's, sure. No, 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 bro. Listen, I want to try. I'll train with you. I'll train with you. I was like, <laughs> I was like, all right. You have your wish granted, you know. So, <laughs> I didn't even use technique with him. I just because he's a strong guy, so I just used pure strength with him. You know, and I, I was picking him up, walking across the entire mat, and placing him down like a child. You know, <laughs> uh, but. You know, I kept busy on him. Like, I, I made him, like, really exhausted. And that was the last day he ever came in, you know? And it's like, yeah. you did this to yourself. Because if I didn't do that to you, you would have quit anyway. And you would have went and told everybody, you know, oh, he was afraid to train with me. So then I trained with him, and it's too hard. And he quit anyway. So some people, they're just mentally, they just won't allow themselves to just take a step back, be a student, learn, understand. You don't know shit about shit. You know, if I went into... I saw you posted a picture of a barn the other day. I don't know nothing about a barn. So if I went and I wanted to learn about barns, and I said, hey, how do you upkeep this? What do you do? What is it? Like, what, what, why do you have one? I wouldn't 
challenge everything you said. I would just listen. I would listen and I would learn and I would try to understand to where some people, man, I think they're just so used to being out of that student role. And they feel almost if you're a student, you're, you're less than right when you're not. And that's why they stay stuck in the same spot, man. You know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I also think that, you know, you have a lot of individuals and I tend to be like this. I imagine even you are probably like this to a degree, you know, like we're impatient and it's not because yeah, maybe some of it is ego for sure. But the other part of it is we just really want to accelerate our learning. And I think for me, the biggest part is like, hold, you said it perfectly. Like take a step back, chill out for a minute. You can be patient. You can still be assertive. I'm not saying to be passive, but yeah, it's that, that's a, that's a personal challenge of mine is like taking it all in, in stride versus like doing everything I can to get everything right now. That's the thing. And it's okay to question I have a student, Sophia. She just got a brown belt, world champion at purple belt, Pan American champion, rather. And anything I say, she questions, you know, and that's her way of learning. At first, I used to be like, Are you, what the fuck, dude? Like, you really? Like, just, <laughs> yeah, I'm not lying to you. But then I realized that she has to process and understand why you have to do things the way you do it before she implements it. And mm. I understand that because she'll still do it, you know. Uh, and yes, impatience, I think, is part of our culture it's part of who we are in in the united states you know when i traveled to like 20, 22 different countries and one thing that drives me insane is their passivity like they're just so relaxed and like i, I was in <laughs> spain it took me an hour to get a menu i'm like bro and i'm from new jersey i'm i'm the yeah. east coast like, i'm not used to this you know but uh and we can't be like that here we just can't we have shit to do you know so it is a part of being impatient for sure. But I think a, another part of it is, is people get so caught up in these fads where they think they can accomplish something quick and mm. they just keep searching for that. You know, they keep, they keep believing the bullshit, you know? Yeah. It's, <clears throat> that's a good point. I've got my um, strength coach and he sent me some programming and I said, Hey man, like, I don't see any, like, I don't see any deadlifts or squats or whatever in here. And I wasn't like challenging that. I was like genuinely questioning, like, like, do you want me to do any of that? And he wrote back in pure coaching form. He says, I want you to do exactly what I programmed for you. And <laughs> but, like, <laughs> yeah, man, we have such a hard time. We know, like, obviously this is my coach. I hired him. His name's Josiah. And I, I hired him to do this. And still we question. It's like, we just can't let go of the arrogance and the ego. You know, I learned a valuable lesson. It was my junior year in high school. I just started powerlifting. I was powerlifting with this guy. And the first I was in there, he had me deadlift 185 pounds. And I was able to do it like a ton. I'm like, all right, let's go up and wait. He's like, nope. no. Yep. Next week, we only went up to 215. I'm like, bro, this is light. I'm not getting where I need to get, you know. And we did it the right way through the way he wanted me to do it. I ended up deadlifting like over 400 pounds at like 16 or 17. And I only did it because I listened to someone who knew how to do it. You know, yeah. so how many people have so much potential yet they don't have anyone to guide them. But then if they do have someone to guide them, they're not willing to be guided. Right. So it's tricky, man. You, um, you kissed your necklace earlier. Do you mind telling me what, what that was? Oh yeah. This is St. Benedict. I always, uh, I wear him around my, my neck and, uh, he, you know, he is like a saint of many, many different, uh, things. Like he protects the, uh, watches over children. He has, there's two sides of it. One side is like a cross and that's to keep like demonic spirits away. The other side he has, he's holding actually a Bible and there's a crow taking something away. And he's actually supposed to be taking like the, the negativity away from him. And, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, uh, I just, I'm trying at this point in my life to stay positive. Last year, I lost my, my father, my two dogs, my damn guinea pig, uh, like everything, you know, and like, like, like for me, it's never easy. So St. Benedict is a protector of like health and everything like that. And it's just, I formed like a, a bond with, with this guy. Uh, Danielle gave it to me. Uh, and, and I just, I wear it every day. It, it's something that, uh, I either wear this or I wear my father's Jesus face that, that he gave me. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm big on like, uh, I know it does. It's just a piece of, you know, silver, but for me, it's just has significance, you know? 
Yeah. I don't think it's just a piece of silver. You know, I think we, I think we give meaning to things that are important, you know, like I, I have little mementos and little memories of my relationship with my father. I lost my father uh, about three years ago. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, it's, um, we had a strange relationship, you know, but there was, there was definitely the connection there and I loved him and I think he's a, a, a good person and I'm excited to see him at some point, you know, in another life. But yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I don't, I don't ever discount like the, the, the meaning that we give to things, you know, whether it's like truly there or not, like, it doesn't matter it, if it reminds you and it helps you, then all the power to you. Yeah. I, I think it keeps me, uh, it brings me back. Like it just keeps me centered. I, I'm a little wild, you know, I, I have, uh, my, my life outside of jujitsu has been very interesting. You know, some of my friends are very interesting people and, uh, I'm just used to a different way of life. Like, you know, a lot of people, I don't understand really the way uh, a lot of people work nowadays, the way they, they function. Like I just wrote something. I said, I never thought I'd live to see a day where even jujitsu guys, they just gossip. They don't yeah, even I saw like, that. I saw that they, they don't even stand, you know, man to man. They just talk shit in their little, in their little circle. And I don't understand this because the way I came up, the way we are, and I don't look for violence ever, especially now I'm 39 years old, but, man, I came up fighting, you know, like that was the most natural thing for me. And if we had a problem, we had a problem, you know, and, and I wasn't afraid to get my ass whooped, you know, I mean, I was afraid to get my ass whooped before I ever got my ass whooped. And once you do, you're like, ah, it's not that big of a deal, you know? So, <laughs> so I try to just keep grounded and I try to keep just not resorting back to, you know, I don't want to call it immature ways, but ways that would put me in a bad position nowadays i can't i can't act like that you know people are just nowadays people just want to talk shit they want you to hit them so they could take you for everything you you have you know it's crazy it's crazy times well i think there's a lot of a lot of posturing on social media too you know like the old <laughs> adage is um like uh the problem with society is that you know nobody can get punched in the face or whatever it is like things like that right and you know we laugh at it and think it's funny but it's actually true there's no real consequence to running your mouth anymore. And 100%. I think that's kind of a problem with, with culture. Oh, it, it's crazy to me that men in our sport, and, and I don't know anybody personally that hates me, but there's a ton of people behind fake screen names that do <clears throat> that they'll talk shit. And then I'll say, okay, if you have an issue, come see me face to face. We could either talk it out or punch me in my face, do whatever you want to do. And then I'm considered the immature guy. But the ones who are behind fake screen names talking shit, nothing's wrong with that. And they think that they don't deserve an ass whooping, yet they could say whatever they want, right? So where, what is the consequence? Just arguing like bullshit, you know, like, and it's so funny, like, you know, you see it too, like all these people talk about bullying, this and that, yet they have no problem getting behind the screen name and talking tons of shit to us right that would be considered if we did it though oh we're terrible people you know it's like <laughs> yeah or if you ever say anything back it's like well just ignore it it's like well look i don't i don't i don't share that for the benefit of that troll or whatever i share it for the benefit of people who actually want to stand up for themselves but don't for whatever reason they're scared or you know whatever but I think people need to start speaking the truth and i think there needs to be consequences i'm not talking about violence either but the problem is is that at least, at least be able to look at somebody right exactly yeah. well wh where do you think the hate towards you anyways and i, I don't know how much there is i don't I, i'm i'm sure it's not a lot but where do you think it's it derives from is it like people that have issues with your message is it people that have issues from your past like where where does it derive for you so what do i hear i, I hear uh i think the real reason is i and i'm very uh I've taken a step back from saying what I truly feel on social media because I was hardcore shadow banned for like six months. Mm. Couldn't even search my name. I think the real reason people hate me is because they envy the things I say, the things they wish they could, you know? Mm, yeah. And I've also done everything I said that I would do. You know, I mean, I, you know, we, with these NFTs, people wanted to, I had a ton of hate with the NFTs. All right. Well, you know, I made 50 grand in a week. So what are you hating at? You know, I had a ton of people. Well, not a ton. I had people talking shit that I was writing a book. 
all right, well, it was a bestseller for three days, number one, and out of 250,000 other books. So why are you hating? But I think sometimes uh, I'm a little bit too blunt, you know, and I don't think people like that. I will call you out on your bullshit, you know, like there's one thing that goes around. It, it's it's a screenshot of me. I really went after this guy one day, like on social media, because he talked about my, it's funny. They block out the part where he, he spoke about my daughter. He said something mm. like, you know, you're such a, like, you're a piece of shit. And I, and I hope, I hope your daughter ends up with nothing because of you. So I was like, oh, and then I went hard, bro. You know, I went really hard. So that was screenshot and people say, oh, this is who Tom the Blast really is. But why did I say the things I, I said? Because this guy said he's lucky that I didn't see him after you talk like that, you know? But it's like, I think we're just living in 2021. That's just what it comes down to. You know, we're, we're up is down and down is up. You know, like nothing makes sense anymore. Like people fight for things that, you know, evil is good. You know, like the, these people doing evil think they're doing good. And it's so crazy to me. You know, it's just such a twisted, twisted time. So, of course, I'll get hate because, I mean, shit, man, Biden's our president. People voted for him. If you vote, vote for Biden, most likely you don't like me. Not that I'm a big Trump lover. I'm not. I'm not at all. I don't give a shit about any of these guys. But how could you support somebody who's a total fucking idiot? You know what I mean? Like, and that's who most of our country, I think now they're waking up. But there's just a lot of more. And then there's people who are completely way out of their minds with everything, you know, who, who still deny COVID and, you know, Listen, I'm that person in the middle. Like, I believe COVID's real. You can get sick. I almost died from COVID. Mm. And I, I'm a healthy guy. It hits people differently. I believe right. now it's much weaker. I believe now it's much weaker. But even though I almost died from it, as soon as I recovered, I was back on the mats without a mask doing what I do. Uh, so I'm not like, I just want people to be able to live and do whatever the fuck they want. And that's it. And I think some people hate me because I literally do whatever I want. I do whatever I want. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And I don't care what anyone says. Have you always been outspoken and been that kind of assertive person where, hey, you see something, you're going to pursue it. You feel something, you're going to share it. Is that something that you've developed? Is that something you've cultivated over time? Or is that just in your, in your DNA? Around 13, I started. There was a big change in me around 13 years old. I, I started like really just being like, I realized that if I lived passively, I would suffer. You know, I was a very sensitive kid. I cared about everything. Uh, I actually, I bring it up in my book. Like when I was molested as a child, I, I, I thought I was going to hell for like every single day. I would cry because I was very you felt guilty. Kid. Yeah, I felt mm. I was the one who was wrong. So one day in order to survive, I basically had to just not care. I had to lose uh any kind of feelings at the time because I wasn't mature enough to know. So I went from like caring about everything to just not giving a fuck. Uh, now mm. I'm, I, I, I still understand the real me has tons of compassion, but I still have that, that chip on my shoulder as well uh, to where I, I can't sit back and just let assholes be assholes. Like I can't do it. Like if I'm, if I'm somewhere and somebody's getting bullied, I can't, I can't tell you how many fights I've been in. Well, back in the day, I wouldn't even argue. I would just hit, like, if, if I saw somebody being severely mistreated, I'll just knock a motherfucker out. That's it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm not going to talk. Like, but nowadays, I'll try to de-escalate things. And, hey, man, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this. Like, I remember there was a, I was at a gas station a few years ago, and my kids were in the car. And this dude, there was like a, a small old gas station worker, a really tiny little black man. And these guys were there. They were like in their 30s. You know those white dudes? In New Jersey, we have, they talk like they're from the ghetto. They talk like they're, you know, like they're like they're rappers, you know? And they were we don't have too many of those in uh, in Maine. So no, it's no, a little not different. Yeah. <laughs> not rural Maine. They were, they were talking, they were disrespecting this guy so much for no reason. This guy's just trying to do his job. Oh, you're taking too long. Oh. And my kids were in the car. I'm like, ah, don't say nothing because you don't know what they have on you, you know? Yeah, sure. Weapon, but I say, you know what? If I if I allow my kids to like see, see me watch this and not do anything, what are they going to think of their father? And they're going to think this is okay. So I got out. I, you know, that's what I had to say. Uh, I could tell the one dude 
you know, in New Jersey, people know me. So I think the one guy may have actually recognized me because he was like, oh, fuck. The other guy mm. still talked, but he talked as he was getting back into his car, you know. And as he came back into his car, my daughter yells out, you fat pig. <laughs> and I was oh, like, geez. I was like, like oh. hon, hon. She hears, <laughs> she hears her father sometimes, you know. But, you know, <laughs> in a situation like that, if someone didn't see exactly what happened, they could look at me and say, oh, I aggressed somebody when my kids were in the car. When in reality, I was standing up for what I believed and treat people kindly, you know. Right. That's people nice. I respect everyone. You know, but if you are a jerk off, I'm also going to tell you you're a jerk off. That's it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I actually watched a video. This must have been last week. I, I think you reposted it from years ago. You must have been outside of maybe a grocery store or something. And there yeah, was a Walmart. drunk guy. It Good was a Walmart? Walmart. Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes sense now that you say that. But yeah, this, yeah. this drunk guy comes out and he looks pretty belligerent. But, with you just talking with him and trying to de-escalate and as opposed to getting in this guy's face, like it actually had, you know, a pretty tender ending, you know, kind of a strange ending that you wouldn't expect, but pretty tender all the same. It's pretty interesting. It it, it is, you know, I know everybody is not, uh, I I like to say I'm I'm more, I could be more compassionate than most people could be, but at the same time I could be more violent. You know, if that guy was in his twenties and, you know, juiced up and, not that drunk and talking that shit, I'd have had no problem, you know, doing whatever I had to do. And and I won't feel bad. I'll I'll go eat right after I'm done. But if you're like, he was a helpless little man, you know, like he just didn't know what he didn't know. Now, Mm -hmm. the 20 year old moron who's juiced up also doesn't know what he don't know. However, he's, he could put me in harm. If he lands a lucky punch, if he hits me, I could be hurt. I'm pretty sure this guy, he could have hit me with all he had and he wouldn't have faced me, you know? And right. I knew he didn't have a weapon. I, I've been in, this is not my first rodeo. I saw where his hands were going. I mean, he had a GoPro. That's about it. So I was like, all right, he's not reaching for anything. We're good, man. I just got to talk this guy down, you know? And when I grabbed him, I made sure I grabbed him really, really firmly. So he realized, and I think that's when he got really, really nice when I put hands on his wrist, you know? And uh, yeah, I'd always rather peaceful endings. You know, I don't, I don't want problems, man. Well, I also think too, though, your, and I wouldn't say propensity necessarily for violence, but your capability, that's, that's a better way to say it. Your capability to administer violence as needed is actually what allows you to be compassionate because without the ability to defend yourself and put people in, in, yeah. you know, dangerous you situations, you know, you, you, you can't have the space to exhibit some level of, of, of empathy and compassion for people you're just, you're incapable of, of doing it. Right. So it's the ability to be violent that gives you the margin in the room to not exhibit it. Plus you also know the, the ramifications of it, right? Like there's real world consequences to violence. hundred percent, man. I think a lot of these times you see these videos of, you know, people getting knocked out and people continue to hit the person when they're knocked out. I think they're hitting the person when they're knocked out 99% of these people, because they're so scared that that person will get back up. You know, so Mm. they go to the extreme. And yeah, I understand fully that if if I hurt somebody, I got to stand before a judge and the lawyer fees and I'll get hammered. You know what I mean? They'll pull up all my social media shit, talking posts, everything. You know, it's going to be a a headache. And another thing I understand is I have some friends that, you know, they don't know how to fight like me. They're not trained professionals. However, they do know how to, you know, take a club and hit people over the face with it. So I understand. Or, that or pull I'm out a gun and shoot somebody. That's the thing. So I'm not naive to the fact that I could lose out there. You know, that's right, why I sure. really like when I'm out and about. I, if I bump somebody, you know, it's funny because I don't really have problems when I go. Like when I'm in Costa Rica, I always use this as an example. I see who's who out there. We're in a different place. And I remember I was there like a year ago. Uh, this dude, this, I think he was from Canada. He's a white boy. You know, you could tell he's a little rich. He, he got his whole face exploded, you know, because people go to different places. They walk around like they own the place. And I tell my friends, mm-hmm. I said, listen, when we go here, you respect everybody from the bartenders to the waitresses, because you don't know. Well, first of all, just be nice, but you don't know sure. who's who, who knows who, who's what. So I find everybody nods at me. They smile, even the toughest looking dudes, you know, because they know I'm not looking for trouble. 
you know, and I'm not. And and the thing is, though, too, they also know that there's a ton of other people that if they wanted trouble, they could find an easier target than me. Right. So it all True. everything, everything falls into place. It's a puzzle. You just got to play it. Well, so you bring you brought up an interesting point about, you know, a lot of guys might say, well, that's, you know, an X factor or something. And like, I don't I don't think it is like I think you can look at another person and pretty accurately like size that individual up, whether this is somebody you want to mess with or not. So Pete Roberts, a mutual friend, I know, you know, Pete. Um, and he was saying the other day to me, he's like, you know, I can look at somebody and tell really quickly if they train jujitsu. And I was like, well, like, how, like how he's like, I don't know. I can just tell. He's just not. And he's not, he's not wrong. Like I, I look, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's true. I don't know about jujitsu. Like if I can tell they do jujitsu, but I can tell like if they carry themselves confidently, um, if they're athletic, if they're strong, if they're sure of themselves, like you can tell pretty quickly, like this is somebody who you may want to think twice about messing with. A hundred percent. And the thing is I'm the smallest guy out of all of my friends for the most part. And the ones who are smaller than me are total psychopaths. And it's funny with me, because, you know, like if it's warm out, I'll wear tank top stuff. And I, I have scars all over my arms, my, everywhere, but yet I'm smiling when I'm walking around. So people are like, wait a second. Something, something doesn't fit. Like he's supposed to be acting like he's tough, but I'm not. I'm yeah, asking, tough I'm acting guy, super. Right. Yeah, but they know I've been through it. You know what I mean? Like I just didn't wake up this way. I've been through some shit. You know? Yeah. You said that uh, when you were 13, you you became like you t- you you went from maybe more of a passive kid to asshole territory, right? So we have to find that balance. But was there something that happened when you were 13 that caused that transformation? I know earlier you had you know, you talk about it, you were molested as a young boy and that was earlier than 13. So was there something else that happened in that time frame, or did it all just kind of come to a head at that point? I think I started, you know, I was going through puberty and I started to think I was becoming a man. And my father always told me as radical as our relationship was up and down, he always told me like, have patience, like your time will come, you know? And, uh, I just felt it was my time, you know, I, I, certainly 14. Like I, when I was 14, I was like, all right. And I wasn't ready for what I thought I was ready for. Mm. Uh, but I thought I was, you know, and, and I got into some scraps of some older kids. And, you know, I remember one specifically, I, I, I was 16 and I, and I had a torn ACL. I tore my ACL and I knew I had a torn ACL and I was waiting for surgery. And, I got in like, I knew a guy who was like in his twenties, tough dude. He, he was known for being tough. We, we were fooling around wrestling and he was drunk and out of nowhere, he hit me. And I was like, and, and it got broken up right away. And my eyes swelled. And the next day it was a 4th of July party at my neighbor's house and he was going to be there. And I was deathly afraid of like having to fight this dude, but I couldn't look at myself in the mirror without approaching him. You know? So I went up to him mm-hmm. and I'm like, listen, Let's, let's do it. Like, let's finish what we started. And I was hoping that he didn't want to do it, you know? Sure. Right. Because, yeah. And I could tell at that time, he just was like, no, Tom, like he knew he was wrong. He didn't want to kill me. And he knew I was just, you know, I, I was trying to be a man, you know? And then I remember another time right after my surgery, when I was, I, I turned 17 <laughs> shortly after that, when I was driving. And I was with my girlfriend and I, I guess I cut off a guy on a motorcycle or something. He flipped me off. I flipped him off. He came right back around. I was like, fuck. He came up to the car. And that was another instance to where I didn't back down, but I was literally praying to God. And I think he saw in my eyes that like, I wasn't a, I wasn't a bad kid, but I didn't want to be a pussy, but he also let me off the hook. So that was two times I was <laughs> let off the hook. And after that, I said, you know what, man, like, Talk a little less, you know, carry yourself strong, but, but don't get yourself into some shit you're not ready to. So I, I kind of laid low for, for like probably two years after that until I really felt like I was really, really ready. So I went like from being like a scared little kid to thinking I was a tough ass to realize that I wasn't to actually becoming pretty tough, you know? So it, it was like stages, you know, it was interesting. But and at nine years old, actually my bully, I, I, I hit him with a rock in his ear and I exploded his ear. Uh, so I had it in me, but I just, I was still doing things out of fear rather than out of confidence. You know, that's what the problem was. 
I think, you know, when we're going back to what you were talking about with, with regards to where some of the hate might come from is I think from the outside looking in, people might look at you and think you're an angry person. You know, yeah. I, I don't know if you totally. feel that way about yourself um, or, or, or not. I'd be really curious to your take on that. Um, whether, whether you feel like you are angry or you were angry and you found ways to overcome it. Like what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I will say I never picked on anyone. I never bullied uh, anyone. And I have, I've always had really good relationships with the kids in high school. Like I was always a popular kid and the kids in high school that weren't very popular. I always was there like a uh, protector, so to speak, you know, mm. I believe I am angry to assholes. Like if you're a bully, like there's, I remember a time in high school, like the, I saw this kid bullying another kid in the hallway and it was, he was just always, this one dude was always fucking with everybody, you know? And I came up and I, open hand slapped him as hard as I could, you know, and nothing, of course, he didn't do shit about it. So in that sense, I was angry watching him be such a dickhead. I get angry sometimes when people are morons online, you know, I, I get angry with the, the state of the world, but overall I am, uh, I'm pretty, I'm softer than I am angry. Like I'm not, uh, I don't walk around angry. Like when I'm out, like I'm not, I don't have a scowl. Like I'm opening doors for men. I'm smiling when I make eye contact. Like, uh, I think when people meet me, they're surprised because I, I also think I just have a, a look that I kind of look like, like a serious guy. Like I look like a, a dickhead, you know, but when people meet me, like they see that I'm like, really not, I'm really kind. I'm really nice. Like I don't throw weight around. I don't act like I'm tough, but there's times like for sure. Like when people like, you know, when they give me a reason, like I'm always quit. Like, I go from zero to a hundred really, really fast. You know, mm. like it, it doesn't take much to get me going. Uh, but no, I, I, I'm not angry. There's been times in my life where I've had resentment and I've had anger, I guess, about how some things were. But when I look at my life, like I'm, I'm lucky, man. Like I'm blessed. Like I'm, I'm thankful. My kids, I mean, I'm soft with my, I'm too soft a little bit, you know? So it's like, I'm probably, <laughs> probably not your exactly daughter more than your son too. Right. You know, well, you know, it's funny. It's actually my son because he's the little guy and he's, you know, I see so much of me in him. And like right now, like he has, you know, he's a tough little kid, but he's just so pure. He's so kind. Like he's not, he, he doesn't understand, you know, you know, our kids, I mean, your son, you know, he's growing. How old is he? 13. My oldest is 13. Yeah, so he's starting to understand. He's starting to become a young man, you know, but like I almost like I love my son at this age, but I almost can't wait until he's a little older. So I, I know he could understand things a little more, the evils of this world. And I think for me, I've seen some terrible shit, you know, uh, to where people have seen the same things I've seen. They would understand why I am the way, I am, you know, and for me, when when people talk out of when, when people think they're smart, yet they're totally ignorant, that pisses me off. You know, like I remember these. Uh, I had a friend. I have some friends that live in North. They're uh, they're they're Latin kings. Right. I don't want to say friends, acquaintances. I, I know them. I grew up with them. I don't hang out with them at all. And during the protest, there was these these white kids that went through there and they started trying to riot and loot and ruin things in North. And they were, they were doing it for, in their minds, they thought for, you know, against racism. Right. You know, and they beat these kids, man, like half to death, you know? So these kids, these young, you know, middle-class suburban white kids walk into a place where they're not welcome, yet they think, they're doing good for these people end up getting beat half to death. Like that's the shit that drives me nuts. When people think they know what they're talking about to where, no, you don't, you, you just don't get this world, you know? And if you want to make changes, you have to do so in a, in a strategic way, you know? So I think ignorance makes me angry for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. How, how, how is some of the stuff that's happened in, in your childhood with, you know, being molested? I hate to keep bringing that up, but that's a, that's an important part. And I know that there's a lot of men who have had a similar experience and still 
you know, really wrestle with that. Um, also having some strains within the relationship with your father, obviously that that was the good relationship. Ultimately, it sounds like based on what I've seen and read, but you know, there's some real strains there. So how, how do you take those experiences that I think most people objectively would say that's a negative experience and have you, do you feel like you've been able to use it for the betterment of yourself and other people? And if so, how have you done that? So when I, when I say this, it'll probably get twisted by some jerk off saying that I'm comparing myself to Jesus, but I'm not. I think in order to truly help people, you must suffer. Because if we don't suffer, if we don't feel pain, how do we understand other people's pain? You know, so whether mm. people believe in this man or not, whether they believe he was a son of God or not, there was a man named Jesus. He was brutally murdered. He was beaten. He was spit on. I mean, he was, they fucked him up. Like people have no idea. You know, I mean, does you gotta, you know, watch somebody get their face beat in and see what he went through. And not one time, not only one time did he ask, why is this happening to me? But he took it. Right. He took every bit of it. And his death brought millions upon millions of people hope right so for me i don't think i was put on this earth to feel like i mean i am happy but i don't think that was my purpose to live a happy life i don't think my purpose was to find love i found love through my my children i think my purpose is to serve and i think my purpose is to by any means necessary and i'm I, there's something wrong with me for sure like there's i'm not a hundred percent normal in my head like i have some uh, i'm i know i'm fucked up and i could look in the mirror and i i'm very smart in the fact that i could dissect things people and myself but i also know that for sure like i'm always <laughs> if it wasn't for my kids I, I god knows where i would be you know hmm. So I think, what do you, what do you what do you mean when you say I know I'm I know I'm not right like I know I'm messed up in the head like what do you mean by that? Uh, you know, I, I, when I was 20 years old, you know, I read about it in my book. I was looking for you know I had a rope that I bought. I was going to hang myself with that rope. Like for me, and and it's hard for people to understand. Like I'm not depressed at all, but I do believe I'll I will be in total peace when all is said and done when I'm dead. You know, because even having kids, I mean. How could we sleep when our kids are not, unless our kids are right by our side? You know, we can prepare our children as much as we want, but yet our kids are out there driving. There's drunk drivers out there. Like, it's scary. No you know, I fear every day, you know? So for me, I'm never, even though things are good in my life financially, it's now like I still, now I have the fear for my kids and are they going to be okay? You know, so I feel, and in my mind, I don't really I don't think I enjoy living for me. I enjoy living for other people. And while I, when I say that, I'm not depressed. Like I, I would never commit suicide or anything like that. Like I'm not, it's not who I am, you know, uh, especially with kids. Like I could, I would never, you know, but at the same time, I do understand my way of thinking is much different than other people's ways of thinking. Like I, I do enjoy the feeling uh, pain and stuff like that. Like, did you ever see Da Vinci Code? Yeah, sure. You see when the guy, the crazy guy was whipping himself over and mm -hmm. over. Like, yeah. I'm not saying that's what I do, but I like that shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, I like, like when my father died, when he was dying, when he was uh, in hospice, you know, like I, I, uh, I rebranded my, my, my cross. Like I wanted to, I saw that. I wanted to feel it was important that I felt physical pain, you know? So I know that's not normal per se, I guess, but at the same time, I know it's, there's always a limit that I have. Like I'm not stupid about things, but I also know that I see things and believe in things that most people don't, you know? What is, what does that physical pain do for you? You know, what, what, what does it bring you? What, what purpose does it serve for you? Like very similar to jujitsu. Like when you're on the mats and, and you're just, dying of exhaustion you can't go anymore but you just keep fighting you keep fighting that like that feeling of like almost like helplessness when you're so tired but you can't do anything to stop that physical pain right mm -hmm. it, it calms me when it's done i could breathe when it's done i'm like i feel better you know it's like it's almost like a teapot you know and that's what i am sometimes you know and not 
an angry teapot, not an over an emotional teapot. I don't know what the emotion is within me. I'm not, I never take my emotion out on other people. I'm never unpleasant to people around me. Uh, I'm always kind to people around me. I don't have displaced anger, but I guess it's internal. But when I get to feel some kind of physical pain, it's like a release of, uh, I could breathe. That's, that's the only way I could I could describe. It. I, I I could take a deep breath. You know. Yeah. It's it's, no, it's interesting. It's it's interesting. I mean, I I feel I don't know that I feel that to the degree you're talking about, but I certainly feel that. I was telling my guys earlier today. We were on a call, and I I feel like I always have a little low level of pain everywhere or somewhere on my body. Oh. You know, whether it's like <laughs> my bro, fingers. Yeah don't work the way they should. Or like my neck this morning when I was training, it was really weird. I, I don't know, even know how I got into the position, but my neck kind of like got smashed up against the guy's back and he rolled and I stayed with him because I didn't want to let him go. <laughs> and and he, I should have probably let go and he rolled. Yes, and I was like, Oh damn, I should have let go. Um, hundred percent. So like, I, I feel you on that. Yeah. But I like it though. I'm like, cool. My fingers hurt or my neck is a little kink today. And I'm like, I, I like that. To me, I think that means that I actually went and did something. If I felt good everywhere, a hundred percent of the time, I'm like, what the hell have I been doing today? Nothing sitting around watching shows, jerking off, whatever. Like this is not how we're supposed to live. That's the important you say that. Cause I say every day I wake up, I'm reminded of like the life that I chose. Right. So I didn't get surgery on it, but I have a torn labrum and I have a torn rotator cuff. My shoulders in the middle of the night, they often dislocate to where I have to put them back in. You know, oh, torn really? ACL, LCL, yeah, torn ACL, LCL meniscus, torn meniscus, broken nose three times, five concussions, broken hand three times, broken ankle, hamstring ripped, ripped off my butt bone. I wake up oh. and, and I feel I'm, I'm hurt, you know, uh, but I'm thankful for this. And I think for me, like I, I have a slip disc in my back, so I couldn't train for a long time. That's when like I like the brandings and shit like that. Like I have to be feeling something you know and i i promise like i'm not i'm not a, like you said i'm just a little bit more extreme maybe than other people but i don't bring that shit to other people you know i'm, mm. I'm weird but competitive like i like i'll make i've made like jokes before about like all right how, how i guarantee you i could put this i could i could heat this knife i could put it in my skin and if i flinch i lose you know what i mean and, and that shit to me is it, 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 it's fun you know but i mean not, it shouldn't be fun. It's weird. And I understand <laughs> that it's weird. You know what I mean? But like, I think, you know, a lot of my friends that I came up with, uh, I was talking about this with my friends, my friend Matt the other day, he was over. Like, we didn't grow up in the ghetto by any means, like at all. But where we grew up, it's different, man. It's weird. Like, a lot of our friends have died of overdoses. One of our best friends was murdered. Mm. Um, and a lot of people just didn't end up in great spots, you know? So overall, with, as crazy as I am, like, we made it. We're, we're, we're doing, I'm doing okay. You know, like life is very comfortable. Uh, except for the fact that I have children and I have to worry about them every day, you know, but I mean, it is interesting that someone is, uh, I guess weird as me could have, you know, reached the success that I have. But I think that's why a lot of people like me because they look at me and they're like, Oh man, like I'm fucked up. So is he. You know, yeah, he's just no, that's relatable. Then I'm very confident. Like I'll, I, yeah, I cry. Like I don't give a shit. I'll say I cry. Like it doesn't mean nothing to me. You know, I never will cry from pain ever, physical pain ever, ever, ever. When I tore my, even like when I tore my my bicep off the bone, I uh, I don't even react when I get physically hurt. Like I was just like, oh, I'm like what's wrong? I was like, I just ripped my bicep. I don't react from physical pain, but emotional pain. Like I'm not that guy that like my grandfather never cried. That's not me, man. Like, I'm like a little bitch. Like, I cry easy. You know? <laughs> I, I can watch a, a movie and cry, you know, like for sure, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, I do what I have to do, man. You know, I get shit done. I don't let anything hold me back from uh, working, from doing what we have to. So, it so, is what it is. so with, you, with, your, with your background and something you just said led me to something um, where – you know, you had this upbringing and you said, you know, it was a challenge and you've seen some crazy stuff and you've done some crazy things and, you know, we've made it is what you said. Do you ever feel like or run across situations where you feel like you don't 
you don't deserve it or you're not worthy of what you have or are you, are you comfortable in that? Are you secure in that? What, what does that look like? That's interesting. I think I deserve some things. You know, I don't get too close to anybody. That's one thing. I, I, and maybe mm. that's something I feel undeserving. I don't know. Uh, I believe I deserve all the monetary success that I have. I believe I deserve all the notoriety that I have. Uh, and I truly believe in my intentions of doing the right thing and never selling my soul, you know. Uh, but I don't know how to really get super, super close to anyone. And maybe that's because deep down, I don't think I deserve it. I don't know. I would have to really like sit with a the therapist and be like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know? But I'm also okay with it. Like I'm not lonely, you know, like, uh, you know, my ex-wife and I, we get along, we co-parent, we do things <laughs> with our children together, you know, uh, she's you know most of the time we're friendly uh i have no problems you know and i i just feel like you know i, I was meant to have kids i don't know what else i was meant to have or, or feel you know, I, don't know. I don't know it's an interesting yeah. thing i'll have to do some real real deep soul searching for sure yeah i mean i asked that because i know a lot of guys come from some some crazy backgrounds and have some even horrific experiences and then they achieve some level of, of success in their life on a different front. And, and they just, they struggle with like feeling worthy of it. And, and what I've seen a lot of guys actually do is they sabotage themselves, even maybe subconsciously because of it, like, I don't deserve this. So they start doing some dumb shit and then, you know, they sabotage themselves and lose everything they've worked so hard to, to have in their lives. We see it all the time, right? <clears throat> we see it with these professional athletes or a bunch of morons. Yeah. Good point. I think, I think, I think we're seeing it. Sorry, Gordon. I love him like a brother. I think we see you with Gordon Ryan. I don't know what the fuck he's thinking sometimes. He has the world by the balls, yet he will eventually go one step too far. And he's mm. not a bad guy, but he, he says bad shit, you know? And it's another thing. Like, I was talking to my buddy, uh, Mitch, uh, the owner of uh, MA MASF, the former Navy SEAL, like, he has his social media deleted three times, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, Mitch, I understand standing up for what you believe in and never backing down. You're not going to win against Instagram. You have to be strategic. Like you can't just go. Remember Ian, uh, Ian Smith from uh, a yeah. gym. In New Jersey? Sure. Yeah. He's gone. He, he is not on social media anymore. And guess what? Out of sight, out of mind, you will be forgotten about if your voice isn't heard. And what I try to tell people, what you just said when people self-sabotage, that's something I'll never do. Now, behind closed doors and I'm alone, it could be a different, it could be a different world. Yeah, who who knows what I'm thinking, what I'm saying to myself or what I'm doing. But for the world to see, I'm never so naive to put myself in positions to where I am going to give the people who hate me the satisfaction of saying, ah, there you go. He fucked yep, up got like we you. knew he was. Never right. will that happen. Never. And I don't know. Like, I, I, I try to tell Gordon, like, bro, like, you got to play the game a little bit better. It's not that you're fake. But if your goal is, to, and this is not him per se, like, I would tell Mitch, if your goal is to change the world and make a change, getting completely kicked off, kicked off social media isn't the way. No, but I don't want to play their game. You have to play the game of the people who are currently in control until you take over control. Once you take over control, you can do whatever the fuck you want. But guess what? Until you do that, you must stay smart. You know, that's it. If you want to be the king, you can't look at that king in front of all of his knights and then say, hey, fuck you. I want to be the king. You're going to get you're going to get your head chopped off. Right. But if you. Yeah, I mean, you're going to make king, yourself a martyr for sure. Exactly. If, if, if you do things smart, if you're strategic, you know, I, I think everything we have to everything we do, we have to be strategic. In. And that doesn't make us fake. It makes us smart. You know, every battle is one in the mind, you know, it's not one with our mouth, you know? Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, you know, one of the things that I see you using your social media for, so it actually surprises me when you say you can't get close to people is man, I see the way that you treat your athletes and your students and 
like you're, you're a big, you're obviously you're a huge fan of them. You're their coach, but you're a big supporter of what they're doing. And you put that stuff on social media. And I'm like, man, this is really cool to see the relationship that you have with, with your people, man. That's awesome. I, it surprises me that you say you can't get close. Cause it seems like there's a level of closeness and connection with those athletes and, and students that you have. There is. And, and I will give, I guess I allow them to get close to me, but I don't necessarily allow myself to just totally be vulnerable with them because, you know, mm. people do some unthinkable shit, you know? I mean, look what just happened with uh, Danaher and them, you know? Their whole team just split, you know? Danaher gave his heart and soul to how many of his students and now they're gone. Now, I'm not saying who was right and who was wrong. I don't know. But at the end of the day, that has to hurt John, you know? So for me, sure, I know yeah. I constantly have to, every day I wake up, I do realize in any relationship that I have, I have to work for it. I never show up to my academy and think I just deserve my students' respect and their loyalty. I give them all of me every day, but I mm -hmm. guess a part of me still doesn't trust anyone. You know, like I, I'm never surprised by the terrible shit people could do. You know, I have been betrayed before in my life, for sure. You know, I, I've, I've been lied to and, and I just understand that, you know, you can't believe, well, what did I say? Believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see. You know, it's like, I guess that's probably the way I was raised. A lot of broken promises, a lot of lies, uh, uh, a lot of just people not holding true to their word. You know, so for me, it's like, I don't even listen to shit anymore. I, you got to prove it to me. You know, so I w it won't affect me of how giving I am to somebody, but just in my mind, there's a wall it's like you know i'll let them like if i can compare it to like a a visual i'll let people come and put their arms around me and hug me but i'll only get too close to you i'm not hugging you you know what i mean like mm. I i'll give you all that i know but i'm still not expecting much from them you know so i uh i guess that's what it is it, and not that I walk around just as a total loner. You know, I have like some really great people in my life. My friends are incredible. They built a house for me in like six months. Like they're just, hmm. yeah, they're awesome, man. You know, and it's like, I, I, I guess a, a part of it is just, it's oh, well, not a part of it. The entirety is me protecting myself. I guess that's what it is, you know? Where does your, uh, where does your, your, I don't know, if, I don't know if it's passion or what, what it is, but at least your desire, where does your desire to serve other people come from? Cause I know you do a lot of good in your community. I know you're, you're, you're coaching these, your, your students and you're helping them not only with jujitsu, but I think that's just an analogy or a metaphor for life. Right. So where, where do you derive that from? And, and, and how do you see your role in, in those people's lives? I think it, that just comes down to me thinking that's what I'm supposed to do. I, I think that's just, you know, like it's just something I should be doing, you know? And, and one thing I learned is that you could give, 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 and the same people you give deals to and you help and you donate to, uh, you know, if you're in a tough spot, you can't expect them to do the same. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and that's not why you're doing it though. You're doing it. So I guess a part of me, it does it to make the big man upstairs happy. You know, uh, hmm. I got to find my way into heaven somehow. <laughs> so I, I think <laughs> I just truly enjoy and I enjoy the joy that it brings people when you do good for them. You know, I think that's like the young Tom. Like when I was a, a young boy, I was just a, I didn't have a mean bone in my body. Man. I was a nice, sweet kid. You know, I remember getting punched in my face and shit. And I never, ever like used to hit people back. Like I would just be like, I don't understand why they were so mean to me, you know? And I think it, part of me is still that, that kid that just would want to give, you know? But then it's also, you ever see the movie Primal Fear with uh, Ed Norton? Ed Norton, Fear? yeah, for sure. <laughs> that That is such a perfect example of me. <laughs> and he had split personalities, you know? Like yeah, he, the, yeah. The, the, the stuttering kid and then, the animal killer but it turns out that he was an animal killer the whole time however right i still believe at one time in his life he was most likely that stuttering kid you know mm. and uh yeah i am two different extremes you know but i believe the real me is the one who likes to give and see people happy for sure 
what are, what are some of your goals moving forward? You know, you talk about with, with, with your body, obviously, you know, the ability to compete and do stuff like that changes and it has over the past five, six years, obviously for you, but what, what are your goals and desires and ambitions for what you have personally going on in your life moving forward? I want to keep growing my brand. Uh, the more I grow, the more people I could help. Like you said today, you know, you want to touch lives, right? And I want to do the same. Yeah, for sure. I don't know if you said it today or in one of your other posts where you had like a negative comment. And you're like, your negativity is not going to bring me down. You know what I mean? Uh, I want to keep inspiring. I want to publish more books. Uh, I want to keep growing my academy, keep building my affiliation. And most of all, I just want to be a good father to my kids. That's the most mm. important thing to me is raising my children to be not only successful, but to be happy and to be thankful and when they grow old like you know it's funny I, I i caught myself the other day i was feeling a little distant from my daughter and i'm like man what's going on like I, I was starting to feel really bad i'm really sensitive when it comes to my kids and i was like i feel she's just like she's not into her dad anymore like she's 10 what the hell is going on but i also notice a lot of the times when she's around i'm doing business on my phone i'm talking about my nfts i'm like i'm doing certain this i'm doing that and every time I pick her up from school, we have 30 minutes in the car alone before her, her brother gets in the car. And I say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, my phone is going down when she gets in the car. Because we're usually just both on the phones. And sure enough, I right. put my phone down. And this week we connected and we talked and we laughed. And we, everything was so great, you know? And then like, I, I make time every night. I, and whether she wants to or not, like, hey, come hang out with your brother and I. And then once she gets there, I just don't say, come hang out and then go on my phone. Like, no, like, I'm playing games with her. I'm talking to her. I'm, and that's the things that are important to me. You know, like how could we become better people overall? And a lot of times, you know, we look at the other person as the problem. Like at first I was saying she was the issue. Like, no, man, I was the issue. You know, mm. I was the issue. Yeah. And it's so funny. I saw something on NBC today published and it said parents who, you know, sacrifice their work for their children are seeing their work being drastically hurt. I'm like, holy shit. Like you're really, really? publishing that if you sacrifice your time for your kids, <laughs> you're going to suffer. But that's what I feel society wants nowadays. They want to rip families apart. They want to, it's just the way people think. And it's crazy to me. So for me, I want to keep that, that closeness is for as long as I could. You know, and that's most important to me to build my brand and everything as long as it's not sacrificing any time with my children. And if, and if it sacrifices like here and there, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build a better life for them, but uh, it just can't be all the time. You know, right, right. Well, right on, brother. Well, let me know what I can do to serve you and to help you, man, because I'm all about it. I've been inspired by what you do and to see how you've grown everything and how you've taken your life and inspired other people. Um, tell, tell everybody where to connect with you on social, um, to pick up a copy of your book, wherever you want them to go, tell them where to go. Uh, my book, you can just type in Tom, the blast on Amazon, um, uh, social media is, uh, Instagram. And then real quick with these NFTs, what people don't understand, they're like, Oh, what are these NFTs? I didn't know much about them. Uh, it's basically original, dig original digital art, right. That mm -hmm. only you could be owner to. So we were selling mine for 2000. You're like, Oh man, you're selling digital art for $2,000. But with that, we're on a discord site to where I'm talking personally to everyone who buys one. Right. So for me, I'm really mm. big on supporting the people who support me. So I want to keep growing the NFT project as well, because for my own selfish reasons, the people who buy into it, I truly believe that they must have something to offer because they're smart enough to understand that they're not just buying a picture, you know? So people with an open mind to want to learn, I also want to learn from. You know, so I also just want to keep learning and keep, keep coming better. And you too, man, keep up the great work. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely clapping from you for you from afar, for sure. Anything you need, let me know. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you, boss. Have a good one, man.